Hi, my name is Jens Gonsen, Vice President at Jensen Hughes. Following up on our previous podcast for this series, today we are going to talk about risk evaluation and the bow tie model. Many new facilities for EV manufacturing and battery manufacturing are being built right now. The authorities need to provide permission. They need to be happy. We all need to have a good feeling about hazards can be adequately mitigated. Sometimes we will find there are no defined requirements, so how can we protect appropriately? So we'll do that applying risk evaluation techniques. We found that is important because we actually did have a number of fire incidences now in large uh, facilities that handle lithium ion batteries, you know, that happens. Um, the question is really not like, you know, if I have a fire, the question is like, when will I have an incident I need to deal with? And it just has to do with the huge amount of batteries that are being moved through these facilities, right? It's just like a probability game in a way, you know? We have now facilities that store upwards of 10 million cells, you know? They're for sure, there are going to be a handful of bad cells in, the, in that storage arrangement, you know? So we need to plan on the cell failure and we need to have something that we can demonstrate, company, the workers and the authorities, you know, that the approach is safe. So when we look at what risk evaluation methods are out there, you know, there are several common ones that we can think of, right? So I'm highlighting here only four that we see in the automotive space or also in other spaces, but I will really focus only on one because I think it's a nice, simple tool to communicate with all stakeholders, you know? So I think we've all seen like failure mode and effects analyses. You know, that's a very helpful tool. I find it's a, it's a good tool to look at product and make the product better or a system. We have hazard and operability uh, studies like HAZOPS, you know, that flow into a process hazard analysis. It's very popular in the chemical industry. We can use that in the environment uh, of manufacturing as well. I think it might be a little bit too complex for authorities to process if they are not specialized, you know. The, the tricky thing is, some of the new battery manufacturing facilities now under construction are going in very rural areas where you do not have um, authorities that have like five full-time professional engineers on staff, you know, to dive into this stuff, you know. So that's where, you know, we kind of need to build a, build a bridge and try to um, communicate in a, in, a, in a simple way, you know, what is really moving the needle. Likewise, fault tree analysis, it's a great tool. Personally, I know it quite a bit from the nuclear industry. Um, it has also the advantage that we can feed quantitative data into it. And then we have a quantitative risk analysis. So we can actually precisely calculate levels of risks. But again, this might not necessarily be helpful when you talk to stakeholders, you know, that are not highly technically minded. So that leaves us with a bow tie analysis I wanted to highlight. Um, which actually has been used in oil and gas quite a bit. And we see it, uh, we see it being used in, in battery manufacturing more often. Um, and that's a very simple visual tool. We can start very simple and build this out and become more complex. And that's a very wonderful tool to make all the stakeholders understand. And we can enhance safety. We can optimize designs. We can reduce costs and obtain that regulatory compliance, which is a hurdle, you know. So in a minute here, we're going to jump into an example, but how does it work? You know, it actually looks like a bow tie, how we're going to feel out, but it, it, we will draw out possible causes and consequences for a hazard, and we will visualize the barriers and controls in place to prevent it. Um, we can use it to model battery fires, and to identify then the potential causes of battery fires and design better, better prevention. If we use the example of our charge discharge area, you know, we have like, you know, the battery pack now comes in, let's say it's a 10 kilowatt hour pack. I used that previously as an example. It's lying on the test table. You want to charge and discharge it, make sure it's good. What we are mostly worried about is that thing going into thermal runaway or catching fire. We put the threats on the left and we put the consequences on the right. 
And then between the threat and the hazard are our preventative barriers in form of those diagonal lines. And on the other side, we have our recovery barriers, right? When we're thinking about what could be threats, we discussed, well, the ba battery could overheat. That would be bad, right? Because like the separator has a very low melting temperature. We don't want that. Um, we could have an electrical fault, right? Could also like harm the separator or we could have a short circuit. So what preventative barriers could we put in place? You know, like you really start thinking about this hard and you wanna have engineers involved, technicians involved, knowledgeable people, operators, right? Get some different perspectives um, because one person doesn't know everything. So then we can install temperature alarms, we can have voltage regulation installed, and we can have overcurrent protection. Now, if that fails, what could happen? We could have the battery fire or a thermal runaway. We could have an arc flash. Somebody could get injured, you know, and what can we do now to recover from that? You know, we can install fire protection, uh, fire suppression system. We can have reactive power compensation and a well thought out um, emergency response, you know? So that's a very simple example, but I think, I hope you get the sense when you sit down with a reviewer from the authorities and you walk through something like this that like everybody can understand that, right? And once you're all on the same page, you start building this out further, you know? So it can, get, it can grow from there and become more complicated. So what's interesting when you see this full bow time map, right? You see that actually that some consequences are actually initiating events for the, for the next hazard, so to speak. So it all interacts with each other, it feeds back, right? But when we recap on it, so what we're trying to do with the bow tie model is we try to, to capture the hazards that we have in the manufacturing environment with lithium ion batteries in a single model. That we can use that to communicate with stakeholders and make sure that our protect, protection concept, our safety concept is appropriate, you know? we use it in the design stage even, very often we use it when stuff is already done, you know, after the fact. It's actually good to use it before that as a, as a helpful design tool so that you can make changes to implement recommendation. And then lastly, again, you know, it is, it is also, it can be used as uh, to demonstrate that you meet an equivalent level of protection, you know, because there, there are some requirements in fire codes but they may not be applicable or not feasible to, to accomplish on the scale that we are talking about today in battery manufacturing. Then you can ask an authority for like a variance, for code variance request, so to speak, that's how it's called, and demonstrate with this model that while you not meet the requirement by the letter, when you meet the intent of it. But then like every good model or software solution is like, garbage in, garbage out, right? We do need good data. We need to have good informed decision making. So the data that we feed in this model can come from performance-based solutions. Thank you for joining us today. We will see you the next time.